Welcome to Think Deeply, Speak Simply, brought to you by Present, a show about the art and science of communicating ideas and how business professionals can unlock their careers and achieve their full potential with great communication. And now, here are your hosts, Jay Rook and Antoine Valentone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Think Deeply, Speak Simply. I'm your host, Shay Rook, and we're here today joined by Alec Torelli. Alec, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here, and uh, it's a pleasure. Excellent. Alec, tell us about what you do in Las Vegas. Well, I'm so I'm not there all the time. That's the first probably thing that I do is I travel quite a bit, and uh, I'm lucky to be able to work online and play poker professionally. So those two things combine and allow me to travel, and I think freedom has always been the top of the bucket list and then only allowing things into, you know, that little matrix that allow me to uh, live life on my own terms. And so poker, I was really drawn to poker for that stayed in poker for that. And then uh, when it came to building a personal brand and selling poker products and services and doing coaching that all fit within that construct of, wow, this allows me to have more of those units of freedom uh, that, that really are valuable. So um yeah, that's a bit about what I do in Vegas. Of course, Vegas is the the mecca of poker. So I kind of right. grew up there. It was like my stomping ground. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, businesses and everything's based there. Um, but yeah, I actually spend time um, part of the year in Italy where my wife, she's from there, her family's from there. Um, so that's, that's really rewarding. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful counterbalance to uh, <laughs> some of the, the madness in, uh, in the US as well, in, in Vegas as well. Particularly. Certainly. Well, that, that sounds like a, a fascinating kickoff. Uh, tell us about some of the highest stakes games that you've played at. Well, they're pretty big. I would, you know, bet a car, get raised a house. Um, there's this game in Macau, which is uh, an island off the coast of Hong Kong. The gaming revenue is seven times that of, of Vegas. Uh, and, the, and the poker sort of follows that. And um, there's a private game there hosted in one of the casinos with these uh, junket owners, which are, they, they own little mini casinos inside of these casinos. Okay. Uh, and so you know, Chinese VIPs and um, they played very high stakes poker. And so I was one of the few Americans that got to play in these games um, through the connections I made and playing regularly out in Macau and being on their good side, learning a little bit of Chinese. Uh, and so those were uh, very high stakes private games and they would typically last 24 hours as well because these guys love to gamble and, you know, was not culturally acceptable for you to leave before uh, they were done because you were kind of you were like the house, you know, so you were providing a service, you were there until they wanted to, to quit. So that would typically be 24 to 30 hours. And uh, of course, if you're winning, you can never quit, uh, or you never get invited back. So yes. those were, those are some adventures out, out in Macau. And then that has to be incredibly challenging to keep one's uh, focus and being operating at that super high mental level at the amount of data you need to process to succeed at a poker game for that many hours. How do you do that? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of my life was just built and engineered and optimized around performing at a high level in that game mentally. So it would be, you know, changing my sleep schedule. Um, just my, my diet was really, really important to eat like certain, like just really healthy and like foods that would be nourishing for my body and mind, uh, exercise routine. So I would do like stamina exercises where I would do sprinting intervals and then walking. So just sprint, walk, sprint, walk. And that kind of mimics what you're doing at the poker table where you have this moments of high heart rate elevation in a big hand and then you rest. And so even while I was sprinting, I was doing like mental exercises while I was sprinting. And I would imagine myself correcting the mistakes that, that I made in the past in the poker hand. So that I was exerting immense amount of efforts, you know, running as fast as I can on a treadmill for a minute while playing a hand of poker in my mind. And if I could do it under that level of stress, you know, on an empty stomach in the morning, I could do it at sitting down calmly at the poker table. So I would, there's just one micro example, but like all of these things were built around treating myself like an elite performance athlete, like an extreme sports athlete, almost, so to speak, uh, yeah. because it was pretty extreme to stay up for 24 hours, betting hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and so I would really try, try and optimize my whole life around that. But even in the game too, I would, you know, not have caffeine because it's great for the highs, but it sucks for the lows. And you have to think long-term, not short-term. So you can't have that fix and that squeeze. Uh, and then I would do like heart rate elevations during the game where I would like, you know, do pushups on the floor. Like I didn't care. There was so much involved that I was like, fuck, I don't know if I can swear, but whatever. I was just saying, you know, I have to do what it takes. I do jump squats in the bathroom, um, hydrate, drink a lot of water. Yeah. There, everything went into it. I mean, it was just the whole life was built around that game. And so fascinating. So, uh, as I think about yourself in your twenties, you know, at some of these high stakes games, uh, guts and courage come up for me as major themes. 
And I'm curious how, uh, how you were managing your own emotions so that you could perform at your best. And you talk about some of those physical uh, and, and meditative and breath work type things that you were doing. But what about that emotional component? I think that's just a muscle that one flexes over time in poker. And the analogy I like to give to people starting out is, you know, think about it like your tolerance for exercise or alcohol. Like in the first, you know, you never have a drink before, you have a glass of wine, you're like, oh, I feel this. But after a while, you get desensitized to the amount of money you're playing with. And even though it's very challenging at the high stakes games, I compartmentalize by thinking about the poker money as its own currency. So it's like, you know, there's US dollars and then there's Mexican pesos. And, you know, so there's poker money and poker money is not real money. And it's very important that you don't think about poker money as real money, because if you're like, oh, wow, you know, I just lost a house because I made a mistake. You're never going to sleep at night. You're never going to live with yourself because it's just like, it's just, you can't get that back in the real world. How, how can you go back to the grocery store and think about the price of an avocado when you're just like, you made a mistake for, you know, a, a lot of those, a lot of avocados, a lot of avocados in every hand of poker. So I think, think about it separately. Like this is its own currency. It's not real money until it comes in off the poker table, not just off the poker table in the micro, meaning one poker session, but off the poker table in terms of segregated finances between my poker bankroll and my personal bankroll, just like an investor might have separate finances from his you know, stock market portfolio and his personal cash flow, right? Those, those are two separate monies. So when the stock market goes down, an investor is not like, oh my gosh, I just lost you know, 10 iPhones or whatever, because it's like, it's separate money. It's like a separate mechanism, a separate decision, a separate process, a separate expectation. And so I compartmentalize very, very uh, effectively in poker because you, you have to, you just can't function otherwise. So um, you learn the hard way. Love it. All right. How about this? You know, today's episode is all about uh, reading the room. And so when you first sit down at a table, uh, talk to us a little bit about how you begin to assess your competitors. Yeah. So, I mean, what you're trying to do is basically understand how people see the world and how that translates into how they're going to make decisions at the poker table. And what I understood over time is that the way that people think about the world is the way they operate at the poker table. So, you know, when I sit down, I'm trying to basically judge a book by its cover. You're not supposed to do that, but it's really all you have, especially in a game where people are, you know, have economic incentive to conceal emotions. They're not just sitting there telling you, hey, I'm a professional, this is my skill set, or hey, I'm an amateur, I don't know anything about this game. They're actually trying to do the opposite of that. So it's called a reverse tell. A tell is when someone gives off information that indicates you know, their, their level of strength or their ability, but a reverse tell is when they're consciously trying to do the opposite. So you have that often at the poker table. But what you're trying to do is just size up the situation and understand what level people are on and then think one level higher than that. So I'm looking at the way, I'm looking at everything. I'm looking at all the superficial things that actually give clues into how these people operate and behave, just like someone would do in the business world, right? You meet someone for the first time, you're trying to assess, is this guy legit or is he a con artist? And how do you do that? It's not the color of his hair or the color of his shirt. It's the accumulation of the package that, you know, your subconscious mind is just quantifying data to just kind of like come to that conclusion right away. So that's what I'm doing at the poker table. I sit down, I look at someone, is he a pro or is he a VIP, right? There's a binary sort of uh, assessment there, just like in the real world. Can I trust this person or not? You know, is he, is he a con artist or is he a legit businessman? Right. And that's what you're kind of doing. And so that I kind of profile people in that way. And then I go down the rabbit hole of saying, okay, like how good of a pro is he? What type of level is he on? How is he thinking about the game? Is he thinking about what I have, or is he only thinking about what he has? And then I try and devise a custom strategy for each player because a macro strategy isn't going to work in a game of, uh, people that's played with cards it's a game of people played with cards so you have to understand the people first and then you can devise a strategy that you know is unique to each and every person love that and, and so as you're doing that are, are there any takeaways uh, from that experience that would be applicable to business presentations well just that um hmm this is a good one um what 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 Give me some help here. What do you, what, yeah, do you, sure. what specifically? So we'll add some of this out. So, so where we're trying to tee up here a little bit around is as one is making a presentation, let's pretend it's a more intimate setting. Perhaps uh, they're, yeah. they're presenting to a board or their team uh, or, or perhaps it's a larger presentation. What are some of the takeaways on, on how to start to read that audience and their reactions to what you're speaking about in the same way? You know, that It's a different level of stakes, but a similar dynamic. Does that uh, help? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned something about tells. Is that specifically what you were asking about or not? Not this question, something, something different. So, something different. So more, so more around, you know, okay. when, when one is presenting, what's the, the corollary for starting to read one's audience and make some of these same things and figure out what the, their uh, emotional sort of barometer is at? Yeah, I would say in terms of reading the audience when at least, you know, me, when I'm speaking is like just paying attention to who's paying attention and, mm -hmm 
like how engaged that person is and then being able to have a plan in real time to be able to pivot and audit. And so a lot of times at the poker table, for example, I'll have a profile of a person and I'll have an idea about what I think about my strategy about that person is. Mm -hmm. But if I'm halfway through a hand or I play one or two hands and I realize, oh, wow, this guy took me for a ride. He actually knows what he's doing. Or he played a hand in this way that indicates that he actually is on this level. I need to really quickly adjust my game plan and go to a different, go to a different strategy. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep losing. Right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over, expecting a different result. So if I, have, if I don't adjust my game plan in real time, I'm going to get the suboptimal results. And so it's the same thing in, in a talk, I feel like, when let's say you come in with a analogy you want to give about a point you're making. Yeah. So if I'm giving an analogy about a point I'm making, I'll start off the point or the talk or the, I'll make the point. But if I see that it's not clicking, I need to be able to pivot. So I need exactly. to have a backup plan that I'm going to say, okay, this is a point I'm going to make, but I need to have two other sub points that maybe I go down the rabbit hole and I go into those points a lot further when I see the audience nodding and looking at me and giving me verbal, nonverbal cues that what I'm saying is sticking with them. But if I see them looking down or looking away or on the cell phone, that, that's, that's a sign. And it's important not to take that personally, but to use that as feedback and say, not say, oh, what, you know, they're being so rude, they're on the phone. No, what am I saying that is not engaging that person so that they rather you know, divide their attention between a cell phone and what I'm saying. So that's a chance for me to pivot. So I always bring it back to what I can do differently. And so if someone takes me for a ride in a hand of poker, I look at what I can do differently to adjust my game plan and my strategy. And likewise, when I'm speaking, it's about understanding the points you're making and how that's resonating with the audience by looking at the nonverbal cues of their facial expressions or their engagement and then being able to pivot or adjust in real time. Right. I'm fascinated by how much you're processing at any uh, given point in time. And as you say all of this, I'm noticing how much of this processing and observing and taking in of data is, is very much external. You know, it's what the other players are doing. Are, are, are your listeners paying attention to you, et cetera? How do you strike that balance between being dynamic and uh, in, in the moment where you're picking up all of these external cues, but still keeping intention and track for what's going on in your own head and your own uh, plays and strategies that you're trying to make at the poker table or the things that you're trying to speak and present to uh, in an audience? I think the key to that is to be really well prepared because if, if someone's an expert at something and they know exactly any question that's going to be thrown their way, yeah. uh, they can pivot really quickly. So if you know the subject that you're talking about, like in a hand of poker, let's say I have a game plan and I'm like, okay, my plan is to bet this flop and then bet the turn and then I'm going to bet big on the river. But let's say that halfway through the hand, my opponent gives a verbal, a nonverbal cue that he actually has a lot of strength. And so then I'm going to change my plan to say, you know what, I was going to bluff here, but I'm not going to bluff because he gave me this tell and I'm not confident in that plan anymore. I'm going to pivot right away. That's because I've played millions of hands of poker and I could pick up on these things and I could adjust in real time time because frankly I'm, I'm i suck at most things in life but I'm, I'm really good at poker like i'm an expert at poker yeah. so i can make those adjustments but i think the key is at least when i gave uh keynotes was being really really well prepared so i could do it in my sleep i could do it if i was i could get wasted and do the keynote because i was so prepared yeah. Yeah. so i think it's really important that you're really prepared because if you're an expert at something and you're prepared at something there's nothing that someone could throw your way or there's no question they could ask you about the subject or there's no uh unforeseen circumstance that could happen that you're not ready for. So if I'm doing coaching with someone in poker, I don't have to necessarily prepare that much for my lessons because I know whatever, I'm confident that whatever question they're going to ask me, I'm going to have an answer to, or I'm going to help, I'm going to be able to find the answer or give them the answer or help them with wherever they're at in their journey. And so I think it's important that when people are, you know, devising, I think this comes back to the macro framework of like devising the keynote is really understanding who you are and what your lane is and staying in that lane so that when you're speaking about it, you're like, really confident that this is what your unique angle is. This is what your monopoly is. What is your personal monopoly? What are you great at that nobody else is great at? And so when I stay in my lane with what I'm speaking about or what I'm coaching, um, then I'm really confident that, you know, whatever people ask or whatever subject comes up, I'm going to be prepared for. So that allows me to kind of do multiple things at once, be having my game plan, but also assessing the situation in real time and then pivoting. Great answer. And, uh, you know, to that, to that point uh, about, you know, staying in your lane of expertise, you mentioned uh, nonverbal yeah, non cues a few times there. Can you talk a little bit about some of the common poker tells uh, and how the, that would translate to business communication? Yeah, so I think the first thing is that professionals are aware of these sort of things mm -hmm. and they're in control of their nonverbal cues. So they're conscious of the fact that everything they do gives away information. Yep. And so they're, they're thinking about that premeditatedly before they move, before they act. So before I bet my chips, I'm thinking, what is, how, how am I going to move my hand? 
how many chips am I going to grab and how am I going to put them in the pot? Because I know that everything I do conveys information at the poker table. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are general tells that people are looking for that indicate hand strength. So if I can do the opposite of that, I could give them a reverse tell and confuse them with different information than, than I, and I could kind of help them think what I want them to think instead yeah. of what I actually have. Right. Yeah. So that you make money in poker by people thinking that you have the opposite of what you do. If someone knows what you have, you're screwed. You need them to think the opposite. So you could kind of engineer that by the way that you're acting. And I think that that's a, that's a difference between professionals and amateurs, where it's amateurs are just so focused on, oh my gosh, I have a big hand. I'm so excited. And they give away all the fact of what they have. And then people can pick up on it. And then they, they can't make any money because if someone knows you have something, they're just going to fold. Right? right. So I think in, in the business world, uh, avoid giving off reactions is important, but you can, you can kind of do what is called trapping in poker. So when, when you're trapping in poker, you're letting someone continue to bet, letting someone continue to bluff, and you're just calling and you're slow playing your hand and letting them think that you have the opposite of what you do. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the business world, this is a important concept because let's say you have a disagreement or a dialogue or you're speaking with someone, you could kind of bluff and give away these nonverbal cues that you're agreeing with what they're saying. You're nodding, you're encouraging them. You're letting them speak more. And in speaking more, you're letting them make more you know, points that are, you know, refutable. So then you can like kind of, you know, trap them and you can give them reverse tells by think making them think that they, you know, that what they're doing is on the right track. Whereas this gives you more talking points to then refute later on in a, in a discourse, in yes. a, in, a, in an argument, in a conversation, in a uh, rebuttal that you're having about something in the business world. So I think that's important too, to be aware that everything you're doing conveys information and that people aren't really, they're, they're adjusting all the time, right? In the negotiations, people are adjusting. When they see that you're, you know, you're aggressive, you're interrupting, they stop speaking. And when they see that you're encouraging them, they keep going. And so I think it's important to be aware of the, the cues and the nonverbal communication that you're giving off. And then also think strategically about how that's going to influence what the other person is doing mm -hmm. and kind of thinking about where you want them to go and put that, put all that together. Yeah. Impressive. Uh, if someone's a nat naturally not good at this, perhaps, what would be some initial advice you would have for helping someone get better at starting to learn how to read a room? Yeah. So, I mean, one thing I always recommend to clients and students to do, frankly, is like, if you're going to play poker, you want to get better at reading people. You need to not be biased by what your own emotional state is, what you actually want to happen. So going in with an agenda or what you expect or going in with a preconceived idea blinds people from seeing the situation clearly. And this happens all the time in poker. They say, oh, I have this hand. I want to win this pot. I feel entitled to win this pot. So they're not thinking objectively about what their opponents have. And so they just, you know, put all their money in, in a spot where they shouldn't, or they fold when they shouldn't or whatever it is. And so I think a way to kind of clear that emotional judgment, the, the emotional uh, stimulation of the ego is just to sometimes when you play poker, just to think about what your opponent's doing. And, and, and the way that I suggest doing that sounds kind of crazy, but um, I recommend people not look at their cards when playing for small amounts of money, because it forces you to just only look at your opponent and think about what does he have and just focus all your attention on him. So it's kind of a way to force yourself to get out of your own way, get out of your own head and get out of your own agenda and only think about the world from the other person's point of view. Because when you can't see your cards, what do you have? You're just saying, okay, I'm not playing my hand. I can't play my hand. Let me play the other player's hand. Let me look at him and think about, okay, he bet in this way. Is he strong or is he weak? Uh, he's probably weak because he bet in this way. He looked kind of weak when he bet. He didn't give away a really strong emotion or he wasn't super confident about the way he was acting. I'm going to raise him. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I have, but I'm just not, I'm not playing about that. I'm playing the situation. And so I think that's important. Uh, and that's really exercise that I know has helped a lot of, a lot of clients as well. I love that. Uh, I can definitely relate. You describe yourself as a uh, full-time traveler as well. And so tell us a little bit about what it is you love about travel, but also uh, what traveling has taught you about learning how to absorb uh, information from your surroundings? Yeah, well, 2020 put a, a change in, in those plans. But um, yeah, still traveling as much as I can. Um, but I think the coolest thing about traveling for me, um, the, 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 the superficial layer was, was seeing other cultures and learning about the world and learning uh, different things about the way other people experience the world and other ways of life. But what was really cool that was unexpected that I think was a little bit a level deeper was coming back to my own reality mm -hmm. and seeing that from a different point of view and understanding that the way that I had always done things, the way that I or America or all these things I was identified with because I associated myself as those things, like I am American and therefore I think like the Americans do for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. And so by associating myself with 
these different ideologies or these different habits or these different beliefs, or routines without ever questioning them because it's, you know, social conditioning and the way I grew up, um, I was un unable to see those situations clearly. But then when I removed from that situation, I lived in another reality. I lived in, been, I've been really lucky to be traveled to probably 50 countries and I've lived in maybe seven of them. I also speak Italian and uh, learned a little Chinese. So, you know, a little bit of different languages uh, throughout my life. Uh, is to be able to see the world from the other person's point of view. So when I came back to living in the U.S. after living abroad, I could see, wow, like this is, you know, the way that like something, you know, whether you're left or right doesn't really matter, but just like the way that we do our system, our political system, our healthcare system is just totally foreign to the rest of the world. And like, I grew up in America thinking that everything the Americans do is the best, we're the best country in the world, because that's kind of like a lot of the social conditioning of America, for better or for worse. And so you realize that like, you're just, you know, one piece of this global puzzle, and the rest of the world actually doesn't really care about America. Like it just, you don't think that as an American growing up, I don't, at least I didn't, I always thought like we were the center of the world. And like, when you go outside the world, you realize like, we're not the center of the world. And so that's one really cool thing about, um, about traveling. I think it's humbling. I think it's unifying in the sense that I see that everyone is very similar underneath it all, even though they all speak different languages and they yeah. have different habits and routines. Everybody wants the same things in life. Um, and you know, we're all like one species. We're all like one collective psychology, like collective group of people. Um, yeah. and that's just like really unifying traveling has been very humbling for me. I, I very much agree with you on the humbling front and, and to your point, it's fascinating to tell somebody from another country about what our healthcare system is like and just watch them be absolutely horrified uh, at how we do things and cracks me up. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, yeah, it is, it is, it's quite a disaster really. Um, yeah. And it's funny because a lot of people think it's like the best, the best in the world. And like, there's, there's certain advantages to privatization and there's certain options and there's a lot of innovation, but like, for the average person, I think it's a lot better in, in a European country. Yeah. Um, so it's actually like, that was not something I grew up thinking as well. And this is not like me, I'm not left really leaning, I'm conservative on certain things, other, right. liberal on other things, but this is just like my empirical experience, just seeing this stuff was like, wow, this is not the way, uh, you know, I was taught to believe that it was. Certainly. Uh, Alec, how about this? Is there anything uh, that I haven't asked you yet that you'd like to talk about? Um. This has been very good. I think we crammed a lot into the time we have, but I guess um, I'd encourage people to play some poker. It's a great game and there's a lot of things you can learn about yourself and the risk taking and uh, decision making and expectation and game theory and analyzing strategic things, thinking multiple moves ahead. There are many parallels that I think help people in life that are very surprising and you wouldn't think that they would, but then the deeper you go into the game and the rabbit hole, the more you realize like there are so many circumstances where you're operating in the real world and you're utilizing a framework that you learned in a hand of poker yes. to operate in the real world, to make decisions that other people don't see that you now take for granted because you've mastered this skill. Yes. So I would encourage people to like learn the game and go a little bit into the rabbit hole and figure out a little bit of the basic strategy. Um, and start thinking about what your opponents have, start thinking about the world from the other person's point of view. And it really, uh, it's, it's a profound shift. Great answer. Um, as far as, do you believe that great business communication is an art, more of an art or a science or both and why? Well, I think about my decision-making process in poker, like, and uh, I talk with this about, uh, with, with Rajat, but I, I think about like, is this logical or intuitive? And people always say that poker has, you know, both components and it's true. Like, can you, do you make decisions based on statistics and numbers or do you make decisions based on logic and emotion? Yep. Um, and, or uh, sorry, or based on intuition, not, not emotion, they don't do that. Uh, and so I think it's like a really a combination of both in poker. Like you make intuitive decisions, you get reads on people. It's, you know, psychology, it's, uh, a lot of that element of poker, but then there's also, there's a math component. You have to know your odds, your equities, your ranges, and you do have to know the game theory. So it's really a marriage of these two things where great decisions happen. It's when you have an intuitive read about something and then you back it up with logic and the numbers and then the numbers confirm what your intuition says. And so I think with business communication, it's a little bit of the same. There's like, there's the art component, which is like that intuitive, being able to pivot, being able to read a room, being able to size up a situation, being able to understand a person and what to say and where they're at that can't really be taught. It's just like, you know, you're either, you, you either have that EQ level or, you know, you connect people or you don't. And then there's also the, the, the logical, the math side of things. There's the science side of things where in terms of like, you know, what the, the Greeks discovered, I believe, and like how to architect a talk with, you know, logos, pathos, ethos. I mean, that is like science, right? Like they, they figured out how to like architect uh, 
a, a discourse to, to convey a point. And that is the science. That's the math side of things. So I think it really parallels the decision-making framework in poker. And you really, you know, the best people have both. The best people know the theory, but they're also able to know when to break the rules because they know the rules, but they also know when to break them. They know when to pivot. They know when to go deeper down the rabbit hole, like we talked about before. They know when to change really quick and switch subjects altogether. They know when to say something they weren't expecting to say, or that wasn't even in their talk, just because it felt right in the moment. And so that's the art side of things. And I think when you combine both of those, you're, you're, a, you're a great communicator. Appreciate that. And then what advice would you have for aspiring business leaders who want to improve their communication? Um, well, if there's anything I learned in poker, it's that you could read a bunch of books, you could watch a bunch of YouTube videos, and you could watch people play poker, but you're never going to get better. Like you're not, you know, you're going to learn more playing for a couple hours than you will studying and reading all that you can study and read. So I think you have to get your hands dirty and you have to get uncomfortable uh, especially with communication with just it was an area where there's like this immediate negative feedback if you know you screw something up you say something stupid you give a talk and it, and it flops or you make a point on stage and nobody laughs at your joke or whatever it is there's that fear component but i think you know bulldozing through that is really the 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 only way to do it and so i think there has to be a period where like you know just have that have those expectations have that long-term time horizon and realize that this is a skill set like anything and so approach it as such approach it as this is something that I can get better at. Maybe you're not going to be a master. Maybe you're not going to be a master communicator. Not everyone necessarily will be. Not everyone necessarily needs to be. But if you can get 30% better, 50% better at speaking or communicating or talking with the opposite sex or whatever it, whatever it is you want to do in, in a communication world, that is really important. And so that is worth dedicating time and effort to because ultimately, like, you know, life is about communication. It's about connecting with other people. It's about the relationships you have. It's about your ability to articulate your value proposition to the world or to a prospect or to other people or, um, you know, to build those relationships. Right. And so I think it's really important to be able to articulate what you're thinking. And so this is like, I think high level priority and it's worth all of the discomfort that you might incur because, you know, this is the game. Well said. Uh, Alec, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going to want to uh, follow you and learn more. Uh, what are some so ways on social media that listeners can connect with you or follow? Thank you. Very easy. I'm at Alec Torelli, A-L-E-C-T-O-R-E-L-L-I, everywhere. And you can learn more about me at alectorelli.com. If you are interested in poker and taking your game to the next level, you want to know some poker strategy uh, and how to beat your friends or competition, uh, check out Conscious Poker, uh, just how it's spelled or just how it sounds. And we have consciouspoker.com and our YouTube is Conscious Poker as well, where I put out videos where I review hands that I played from around the world, different games and stakes and tournaments and cash games, as well as hands from my clients and students that they send to me. I also take people's questions and answer them in videos as well. So that's fun. We put out regular content. Uh, I put out a lot of content on that YouTube um, and it's a lot of fun. It's gotten better over the years and I think we, we you know, produce some good stuff. So that's fun. How exciting. Conscious Poker is a great name. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Awesome. Well, Alec, on behalf of myself and all of our listeners, I just want to say thank you for carving the time out to share your experiences and insights with us today. We very much appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Think Deeply, Speak Simply. To learn more about the art and science of communicating ideas, visit our free resources at present.com. That's P-R-E-Z-E-N-T dot com.